So today, as I light my chalice, let us continue the practice that we have done since the beginning of this pandemic, where if you are lighting a chalice or a candle uh, in your own neck of the woods, please let us know what neighborhood, what street, or what city that you're lighting a chalice so that we can gather those, uh, gather those thoughts and we can be together in spirit. Flame of fire, spark of the universe that warmed our ancestral hearth. Agent of life and death, symbol of truth and freedom. We strive to understand ourselves in our earthly home. And as a uh, people are putting into the chat where they're letting the chalice from, we're now gonna turn our attention towards joys and sorrows. One of the most important ways that we gather together at People's Church is to share what is truly important to us in our lives. And joys and sorrows is one of the avenues for that, but by far not the only one. So if you have something that you'd like the community to share in, then you can please put that in the chat. Then uh, I will endeavor uh, to, uh, to read those. And uh, uh, if you would like to share that something is going on in your life, but you would actually not like to share what that thing is, you can just say stone, please. And this is a tradition we actually got from another church that uh, I have found has been very, very powerful for us because it's a way of us uh, sharing those things that might be private so people can send out uh, to everyone uh, that something is going on and we can say, we say a secret prayer for those people. People's church is a very generous place. It's a place that, uh, you know, I think of all the great words of wisdom that I've learned from people just sitting around during a potluck. All the wonderful people I've gotten to, to know and to have community with. So we are generous with our words, we are generous with our deeds, and we're also generous financially. And so now is a time when we ask for that generosity again in the form of an offering.
please join me in giving thanks for all that sustains us. From the countless gifts we each have been given, gifts of life, and love, and sustenance, we bring these small portions to share in the works of love, which none of us can accomplish alone. Thank you, Savannah, for those wonderful songs. Thank you for that uh, wonderful round um, gathering here. And thank you for Peace Like a River. I also would love to thank uh, Chris Luter, who doesn't get enough credit for all the work he does to make these church services completely seamless and just flow like the river. Our two readings today are of an archaeological nature. First, uh, the introduction to the edited volume of Archaeologies of the Heart by Natasha Lyons and Keisha Sapernit. Our intention with this volume is to work towards an archaeology of the heart. This is an emergent practice drawn from various strands of archaeology and other disciplines, which are unpacked below as we conceive and share our thoughts with you. These thoughts have been many years in the making. We aim to create an archaeology that speaks to the whole person, our intellectual, emotional, spiritual, and physical selves. We aim to put heart into our understanding of the past by reframing our analysis to consider the powerful role of emotion, love, and connection, though not at the expense of rigor. We aim to center the heart in our modes of practice through how we relate to one another as people, our students, our other archeologists, community members, and diverse publics. We aim to take the best of what our whole selves offer and to make an archeology span that makes us better people, better archeologists, and a kinder, more inclusive community of practice. And our second reading is from Decolonizing Archaeology, uh, Decolonizing Archaeological Practice at Fort St. Joseph by Michael S. Desaini. Many archaeologists are beginning to strive towards social justice and right relations that entail honorable dealings with other uh, integrity of action and goodness. There is a profoundly spiritual dimension to the work we do insofar as archaeology can amend past wrongdoings and create greater equity in a world marked by divisiveness, competition, fear, and hopelessness. We are at a place where archaeology can help us recover from a colonialist past and work towards reconciliation in the process of healing and making ourselves whole. It is an exciting time to be engaged in archaeological inquiry for those who choose to embrace these opportunities. And now I'd like to introduce our main speaker for today. Um, Michael Nassani is a longtime member of People's Church. He's uh, been with the church since 1992. He is now a professor emeritus of archaeology from Western Michigan University. Um, he has um, lived in Kalamazoo for 28 years, or he lived in Kalamazoo for 28 years, and has recently, since retirement, uh, 
Michael Nassani. Sorry about that. I had a phone call coming in. Uh, the main computer that I might have used, my wife Stephanie has to use for another call that we're that I'm supposed to be on. So I'm having to use my phone. And when calls come in, I get muted. So um, anyway, marvelous stuff about Michael. Um, he is now uh, living in South Haven, and we're excited to hear what he has to say. So take it away, Michael. Great. Thank you, Chris. Can you hear me OK? Great. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, my role in the church, how it connects with what I've been doing as a professional, uh, and to talk on the topic for today which I'm gonna pull up some notes here to assist me. And I thought it might help those of you also who are visual learners uh, to talk on the topic of how an archeologist found balance at People's Church. So here's a few of my talking points. Um, as you can imagine, it's, it's hard to condense um, well, any, any significant topic into 15 minutes, uh, but I will try to do so. Nevertheless, 28 years of growth and development uh, in the church, but uh, here we go. So, so many of our stories are autobiographical. Uh, you know, this is, this is where our stories begin. They begin with our experience and so forth and the way we relate with the world. And so that's what I'm gonna tell you a good bit about today. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about a time when, in hindsight, I would say I was pretty much out of balance. And I'll tell you what I mean by that in a little bit. Uh, and of course, you know, this is this is the story of, of redemption, to some extent. Uh, and so I would say that I'm privileged, I've been privileged to find at least a little bit more balance. So I wouldn't say I'm completely balanced, but at least a little more balanced now in my life. So when I'm talking about balance here, uh, just so we're all on the same page, I'm talking about feeding all the parts of the self and integrating the different worlds in which we live, right? So all of us have many parts of ourselves, intellectual and physical and so forth. And I'll say a little more about that and making those things fit together, together, giving them equal time, or at least creating some balance for them, um, as well as uh, many of us often live in very disintegrated worlds. So we might be doing this for family, and then we might be doing that in work, and then in work, we might be doing three different things that don't really relate and so forth. And um, I've been fortunate insofar as the different worlds within I in which I live, um, I think I've been able to integrate, um, and I'm, I'm fortunate to have been able to do so, I think. Kind of speaking in the past tense here, only because I'm recently retired. So, um, you know, it's not to say that um, I don't continue to try to do a lot of what I'm talking about now. And in fact, it's all a journey and a process of refinement. Uh, but anyway, here's me in a nutshell. Uh, you know, positionality is so important, and uh, what I'm talking about here is my identity as a white, male, middle class, bicultural, right? My, uh, my grandparents were all from Aleppo, Syria. I spoke Arabic as a child, so to some extent I was raised in a bicultural household, uh, a recovering addict and so forth, right? So there's lots of different aspects of my positionality, I think that, uh, of my identity that, that form uh, the way I relate to the world, obviously. Um, I'm foremost an academic, have been for a long time. And even before that, before I was hired at Western Michigan University, a long apprenticeship in graduate school and, and so forth. So, uh, I was fortunate to be selected to be uh, to join the faculty at WMU. So as a university professor, uh, husband, father, son, and so on. And there's some significance probably to the order that I've put these in, and that might reveal itself in a minute or so. Um, and I'm an archaeologist, right? This is more like a, uh, it's it's more than a career. I mean, it's very much a, it's like a vocation, if you will. 
Um, and so I spent a lot of time recovering other people's stories, oftentimes those that mirror my own. So we find that archaeologists often find that they gravitate towards uh, people's past that somehow mirror their own. And then they put some of their own stories into those, those past stories and so forth. And so there's a lot of conflation that goes on there. Um, and archaeology is also as a metaphor for, for digging, digging deep, right, to reveal one's inner self and so forth, peeling away layers and so forth. There's aspects of recovery in more than one way, right, recovering, recovering something, an object as well, and a past as well as recovering from some set of conditions and so on. So these things all fit together. So when I talk about being out of balance at one point, right, for a very long time, I emphasized the intellectual, right, the expense of other parts of my whole self. Uh, as far back as I could remember, I was always comfortable in school, comfortable with thinking about things in that, in that, uh, that environment and so forth. And it just propelled me to spend more time in school and then you know, I, I never left school, right? Because I went on to become a university professor and so forth. Um, but that wasn't completely healthy. As much as I embraced that, I don't think it was completely healthy. Uh, because for a long time, I really ignored the physical, emotional, and spiritual parts of myself. So while I exercised and ran cross country in high school, uh, I went for decades without doing anything for my physical self and my emotional self also suffered, particularly while I was in active addiction um, and uh, spiritual parts of myself. Um, you know, I was raised in a church setting, uh, didn't really embrace it very much after high school, if you will. And it was a long time then before I discovered people's church and so forth. Um, so the spiritual part of myself was was hidden or at least I wasn't in touch with it for for a very long time um, whenever I would be faced with the physical emotional and spiritual parts of myself uh, facing these these areas really took me outside of my comfort zone and it was often difficult to, for me to acknowledge that as well uh, I was after all home in the intellectual in an academic setting. So a whole series of um, changes uh, took place in me and the discipline surrounding me and, and so forth that, that have allowed me to, to begin to restore some, some balance in my life. And I'm fortunate that this has happened. And I'm also very privileged. Uh, to be able to do so, to be able to restore balance. And I'm thankful for many tools at my disposal, uh, you know, therapy and counseling, for example, uh, loving family and friends, uh, uh, the, the uh, community of people's church and so forth. So I was able uh, to take advantage of, of, I would call them, you know, tools that would assist me in restoring balance. So at People's Church, right, the spiritual opportunities that it provided and the seven principles, right? You don't have to ask, ask me to name them all, but uh, I would fully, fully embrace them. Um, you know, particularly the issue of the, the, the dignity of each and every, the worth and dignity of each and every person. And I'll come back to that. And there was a life-changing event, you know, about 20 years ago that helped me to begin, or begin to recover from my addiction and, and led me on a road to embrace my physical and emotional self. So as I said, uh, undergoing uh, uh, therapy and counseling, uh, going to the YMCA every day, you know, I woke up this morning, it's like, well, today's my day. I, you know, got the running shoes on and did the three and a half miles and and it's it, it's it's life it's life sustaining for me to have that kind of balance um, in those various areas the spiritual the physical and the emotional to balance the intellectual which I haven't haven't stopped hasn't stopped being important to me even though I am retired 
So sort of back to academia, let me talk about balance in a slightly different way. You know, the, the pillars of academic life, uh, and I spent, you know, many hours a week engaged in this, uh, is doing research, uh, is teaching my students, as well as service, right? Service to the university, service to the community, and so forth. And I was fortunate to be able to carve out in my career um, uh, interests, research, teaching, and service interests that overlapped fully, right? So the work I did at Fort St. Joseph, I was able to teach about that. I was able to write about that. I was able to engage in service for the, for the Niles community as well. So that was very, very integrated for me. And I was fortunate that that was the case. Um, there are also simultaneous and reinforcing changes in my life as well that I alluded to um, earlier. Um, you know, archaeology as a discipline, as I think some of those quotes at the beginning uh, indicated, uh, some of the readings there, as a discipline became much more humanistic over the course of the last two or three decades and so forth. So people were put, were, were made central uh, to a lot of what archaeologists did, and uh, people who were disenfranchised, people whose, hidden, whose histories had been hidden, people who had been marginalized and so forth, were being lifted up through archaeological work as well. And so I think that's important. Um, and again, in terms of spirit, spirituality, as was alluded to in the readings, uh, you know, the recognition, as I mentioned earlier, of the worth and dignity of every person and the connectedness of uh, tan tangible and intangible heritage and, and uh, uh, animate and inanimate objects and so forth. And uh, this created some degree of holism for me as well. And I was able to feed back some of this, some of my, my work in uh, some, of my, some of my spiritual connections then came to inform the archaeology that I did. And at the same time, archaeology was changing and was receptive to these different ways of seeing and thinking. And another important piece of it that cross cuts all of this is the anti-racism work that I've been involved in. Um, some of it took place outside of people's church, but some of it was inside of people's church as well, right? This journey to call out and identify and speak out against inequities and a means, it was a means of recovery to really find our authentic selves, right? Our selves that haven't been misshapen or we have been misshapen by the racialized hierarchy that we live in, but what is our authentic self? What are our authentic selves like apart from, from those conditions and so forth? So to sum up, um, over the course of my life, I've been, be, been able to become more whole, I would say. Um, I'm not sure it's something that I conscience, consciously strove to do, but I always felt like there was something, there were things that were missing. Things were frankly out of balance. And by restoring balance, I've been able to restore some wholeness as well in my life. Um, I've found physical, spiritual, emotional, and intellectual balance, uh, not only through uh, the church, but through the work that I do. And I was fortunate to have the space to be able to do that. Uh, as I said, you know, to have a life and a career in which I've been able to work to recover hidden histories, to recover from addiction, and recover from systemic racism. So recovery is a, is a, is a central message here. Uh, connectedness is central as well. Uh, and these all for me fit with, um, with holism as well as with balance. And let's see, that might be near the end of my, ah, oh, here we go. I did have another important point in just closing. Uh, that is that being part of people's church has been an important vehicle for my journey. And much of what I've learned through people's church, through the anti-racism work that I do, 
I'm now trying to pay it forward through the service that I do in a very, in a number of professional organizations that I'm a part of. So trying to bring this more humanistic, um, holistic, uh, more humble and compassionate way of seeing the world. Uh, I'm essentially trying to, to, to put that into practice. Um, and uh, so far it seems to be working and uh, I'm, I'm quite pleased and quite happy that it's played out this way for me. And I'll just close with this image here. This is on the right is one of our Native American partners. And he is engaging in a smudging ceremony. He's burning sweet grass. Uh, and we've been conducting the ceremony for a number of years. He's been conducting it for the archeologists at Fort St. Joseph as a way to kick off the field season. And it's a way to uh, essentially make us a little bit more cognizant of uh, what we're doing and as we break the earth and as we recover objects and so forth. Um, and it's a, very, it's a very spiritual act that we engage in before we conduct this archeology. span So I'll leave it at that. And let me, I don't need to share my screen anymore. So I will stop doing that and I'll turn it over to Chris, correct? Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much for sharing that portion of your life. Thanks for really willing to, uh, to go on that journey. So now we're going to be having a discussion. The discussion is gonna take place in a breakout room and you'll have about 15 minutes to uh, discuss some questions that I will um, read to you in, uh, in a minute. Um, so we do have some um, rules for discussion, uh, some guidelines for discussion. Uh, we ask that you please speak the truth as you understand it. Uh, and uh, to avoid inhibiting the flow of the discussion, we ask you not to comment on other people's comments until everybody has had a chance to uh, do some sharing. Um, we, if you are people on the, the, in the circle that you don't know, please introduce yourself. Um, uh, please uh, let everyone know the, the nouns that you'd like to, be, uh, you'd like to use for reference. Um, and then, um, so then here are the questions. And then also just know that uh, when there is a minute left, um, you'll see a little notification and then we would ask you to wrap up the discussion and you'll come back here to the main room for a, a closing song that we would really love you to participate in. So here are the questions for sharing and for listening. Is balance necessary in your life? Why or why not? If balance is necessary, how do you create balance in your life? Finally, how do you restore balance and reconnect to what's important to you when your world is out of kilter? And with that, Chris Schluter will do the zoo magic to put us into uh, breakout rooms. I would like to thank everybody who was willing to share about their lives uh, on the call uh, and on, in, in your breakout rooms. I love the people that I was sharing with and I would love to sit down and talk with them about all the, 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 the points in their lives. And it was just such an important topic. Thank you, Michael, for bringing it up. Thank you for sharing yourself, Michael. And uh, I just wanna thank everybody who's on this, uh, on this Zoom call for sharing themselves and really participating in this. Now, um, please join us in our closing song. Tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free, tis a gift to come down where we ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, to be in the valley of love and delight, when a true simplicity is gained, to
I would love to invite everybody who would like to participate in the coffee 15 minutes to stay on the line. And then just as happened before in our discussion, you'll be invited into a breakout room and you can keep sharing about this topic or anything else that's happened in your life, the delights and the wonders or the stumbling blocks, it all can be shared and it is all important. And now, before we extinguish our chalice, our closing words. By John Murray. Go out into the highways and byways. Give people something of your new vision. You may possess a small light, but uncover it. Let it shine. Use it in order to bring more light and understandings to the hearts and minds of men and women. Give them not hell, but hope and courage. Preach the kindness and everlasting love of God. May we all have that kind of spirit in us. And again, thank you from the bottom of my heart for letting me share in this wonder of this morning's service.